my previous lecture, I described the Tychonic system. The Tychonic system was devised by Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe amassed all of this observational data over decades with the intent of proving his own pet theory of the solar system. Regardless of what a great observational astronomer, however, that Tycho was, he didn't really frankly want to do or bother doing the grunt work when it came to the math. So he hired a mathematician to then take all of his data and use it to prove the correctness of the Tychonic system. That was Johannes Kepler. So now we're in the early 17th century. And we have Johannes Kepler. He was the mathematician hired by Tycho Brahe to prove Tychonic system. Before Kepler even has a chance, however, to get started, fate kind of takes a turn for the worse for Tycho Brahe. In October of 1601, the Danish nobility threw a banquet for the Danish king. As part of the nobility, Tycho Brahe was in attendance. And you can just imagine how these affairs went on. They would be sitting there at the banquet table, probably for hours, drinking flagon after flagon of ale. Now at the time, it was considered to be rude to excuse yourself to use the restroom before the king did at these affairs. So there's Tycho sitting at the banquet table, drinking probably gallons of ale as the meal proceeds. Unfortunately for Tycho, however, the Danish king was not drinking. So then therefore the king actually never got up to excuse himself to use the restroom. Tycho was probably sitting there at the banquet table literally for hours waiting for his opportunity to use the restroom, but that opportunity never arrives. Now, get this, his bladder burst and he died of peritonitis a couple of days later. Tycho Brahe literally drank himself to death at the banquet table. So now Tycho Brahe is dead. What happens next? Well, Brahe's family would not allow Johannes Kepler to obtain all of the data. And the reason for that is because according to Tycho's family, all of this was part of their family wealth. This was basically their heirlooms. Now it turns out that Johannes Kepler was first of all a serf. He was not part of the nobility and he wasn't even Danish. He was Austrian. So then therefore, are you as part of Tycho's family gonna give all of your precious family wealth to this yokel from the sticks? Probably not. So then therefore, what does Kepler do? Well, Kepler literally steals Tycho's data and runs off with it. I'm not kidding. That's how Kepler finally gets his hands on Tycho's data. Once Kepler obtains Tycho's data, however, he completely discards the idea of the Tychonic system. He basically says there's no way that this is correct. Instead, Kepler is motivated to do the following. Take Tycho's data and use it to, once and for all, prove Copernicus correct. That's Kepler's motivation. So after Tycho's death, Kepler intends to use the data to, once and for all, prove Copernicus correct. The task in doing so turns out to be enormously difficult. And the reason for that is because regardless of whatever mathematical tricks he resorts to, Kepler cannot fit the orbit of Mars as a perfect circle around the Sun. It simply can't be done with the level of precision of Tycho's data. In other words, Tycho's data is so good that it won't let you actually fit the orbit of the planet as a circle around the Sun. So then therefore, Kepler is basically faced with a dilemma. He can either, one, trust Tycho's data, and this then means that he has to throw out the idea that all motion in the heavens has to be perfectly circular. Or two, he could assume that Tycho's data is wrong, and then therefore he could fit the orbit of Mars as a circle around the sun. Now, Kepler knew full well that Tycho was a very good observational astronomer. So then therefore Kepler decides to trust Tycho's data. This then means that he has to throw out the idea that all motion in the heavens has to be perfectly circular. He then searches for another curve that will then fit the orbit of Mars around the sun. 
After years of work, he finally fits, hits upon the answer. The answer becomes the first of Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. The first of these laws describes the curve that all planets follow as they orbit the Sun. The planetary orbits are not perfectly circular, instead they are elliptical. Okay, here are some of the basic geometrical details of ellipses. For some of you, this will be a bit of a review. For others, you may be seeing this for the first time. Okay, let's say right here is the ellipse itself, like so. And then if you're probably aware of this from prior math classes, there are two points here within the ellipse that are important. These two points are referred to as plural, the foci. The singular is focus. Okay, here's the geometrical significance of those two points as a refresher. Regardless of where you may be on the ellipse, the sum of the following two distances is always the same. So for example, let's say that you're right here on the ellipse. This distance here plus this distance here is the same if you're talking about, say, this point on the ellipse. That is, this distance here plus this distance here is the same as it was before. Therefore, this then allows you to trace out the ellipse itself with respect to these two foci. Okay, now the word focus. The word focus is actually the Latin word for fireplace, and Johannes Kepler was the first person to use that word in this context. And the reason for that is because what Kepler discovered is that the sun is at one focus, and there's nothing at the other focus. Right here is the sun. Okay, now let me go ahead and draw an axis, like so. It passes through the two foci, and it also passes right here through the center of the ellipse. This is referred to as the major axis. If you divide it in half, like so, this distance right here, this distance right here is referred to as the semi-major axis, and it's always labeled as A in this basic introductory description. So A, semi-major axis. Okay, now take a look at this distance here, the distance from the focus where the sun is located to the center. That distance is smaller than A, it is some fraction of A. This distance right here is referred to as EA, where E is a number that is less than one, and it's referred to as the eccentricity of the ellipse. So E is less than 1, and it's called the eccentricity. The reason why it's referred to as the eccentricity is just like in the social context of the word eccentric. If you know somebody that's a little bit eccentric, they're a little bit off-center. Kind of the same idea here. The focus is somewhat off the center of the ellipse. The amount is described by the eccentricity. Once again, it's a number that is less than 1. In fact, for most of the planets, it's extremely small. In the case of the Earth, the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit is only about 1.5%. In other words, the Earth's orbit about the Sun is very nearly a circle. In the case of Jupiter, the eccentricity of Jupiter's orbit is actually less than 1%. Very nicely, the orbit of Jupiter about the Sun is very nearly a circle. It turns out that Mars, however, has an eccentricity of 8%, or excuse me, 9%. That 9% eccentricity of Mars is just enough in order to be able to see it with the level of precision of Tycho's data. Tycho's data, in other words, was just good enough to see the eccentricity of Mars. So that's a nice little bit of serendipitous coincidence. It turns out that Tycho Brahe basically concentrates his observational efforts on the perfect planet, the planet Mars, which has a large enough eccentricity that can be seen by his data. That's a nice little bit of serendipitous coincidence. Okay, there are two other points here on the ellipse, by the way, that are important. This point right here. This point right here is the point of closest approach by the planet 
to the sun. This positioning is referred to as perihelion. The Earth, by the way, reaches perihelion in its orbit in early January. This turns out to be wintertime, however, here in the Northern Hemisphere, but the difference between the closest approach of the Earth and the furthest approach of the Earth to the Sun is very small. It's so small that it has no effect on the climate. Okay, now over here, the point of furthest approach, in other words, that's the farthest that the distance can be from the Sun, the planet can be from the Sun, this is referred to as aphelion. Earth reaches aphelion in early July. Okay, and then secondly, teasing out from Tycho's data, basically Kepler discovers two other mathematical relationships, the second and third laws. Kepler's second law is a little strange. It's sometimes referred to as the law of equal areas. And here's the basic description of it. Once again, let's say that right here is the ellipse. Let's say that right here is the sun at one focus. What Kepler discovered from Tycho's data is that when a planet is close to perihelion, in other words, it's the closest approach to the sun, this is when it's moving fastest in its orbit. He also discovered that when the planet is close to aphelion, that's when it's at its furthest point in the orbit, this is when it moves slowest in the orbit. What we're now gonna do is take a look at the motion of the planet over two time intervals. We'll call that time intervals T, and they're of the same value. Let's say in this time interval T, we watch the planet when it's fairly close to perihelion. That is from here to here. Well, as the terminology goes, the planet then creates or sweeps out, as we say, an area here on the ellipse like so. And now let's take a look at the planet when it's on the other side of the sun, when it's close to aphelion. So for example, here to here, like so in the same time interval t. Remember, it's further from the sun now, so it's moving more slowly in its orbit as discovered by Kepler. Once again, as the terminology goes, however, the planet here sweeps out, as we say, an area on the ellipse like so. Equal areas in equal times. This is known as the law of equal areas. These areas are equal. The important thing to realize, however, about Kepler's second law is that it's mathematically predictive. In other words, you can use the mathematics of the second law to predict at any time in the future where a planet is going to be in its orbit as it orbits the Sun. And then when we make those theoretical predictions using the mathematics of Kepler's second law and then match it up with what we see in the sky as the planet does orbit the sun, they match exactly. So then therefore Kepler's second law is predictive. That's extremely important. Okay, and then lastly, the third law. Kepler discovers a seemingly very simple relationship between two very important numbers about a planet's orbit about the sun. It's sidereal period P and the semi-major axis of the orbit A. What Kepler discovers is that P squared is equal to A cubed. As long as the sidereal period P is measured in terms of years and the semi-major axis of the orbit is measured in terms of astronomical units. P squared is equal to A cubed. It's important to realize, however, as we begin to conclude this lecture on Kepler's laws, is that Kepler discovered these three laws of planetary motion empirically. The word empirical in scientific lingo means that you made this discovery from data, not from underlying theoretical principles. So basically what Kepler essentially did was he teased out of all of this data that Tycho amassed these three mathematical relationships that perfectly describe the orbits of the planets about the sun. However, notice what is lacking. What is lacking is a physical explanation. Why do the planets obey these laws? Kepler discovered that the planets do obey these laws, but he then actually spent the rest of his life looking for a reason why. Why do the planets obey these laws? He never did find that answer. So what was lacking was a physical explanation. Why do the planets 
obey these laws. Kepler discovered these laws empirically from Tycho's data. That concludes this lecture on Kepler.